just under the, which I think the, this is I think the best title of any session we've seen here so far. The answers to questions you didn't even know to ask. So a brief talk with Shiloh. <laughs> We're going to talk about this. And I don't know what this means. I don't know what the questions are. So I'm going to ask so those. We'll do the agenda today. What we're going to do, we're going to talk about some more. We're going to talk about the password and answer. I'll introduce Neil in a minute. Unfortunately, Neil has the flu. So you might hear this one. Uh, we're going to talk about the change, what they've asked to do, what they want from an evolutionary standpoint. Well, we came back to it from a revolutionary standpoint. We're going to talk about AI today. We need to understand how we use that today to make a difference. Not tomorrow, not some constant, but things can really go on. What's the difference that it's making? We, we always, the sold lot, we always ask what we do. And then what's next? First thing is this is pretty epic here. Uh, they're one of our most valued customers. We've been doing business with them for over 20 years. Uh, Neil is going to be here today. Neil Norton, he uh, leads the team that picks other technologies and helps get these things implemented. Unfortunately, Neil has the flu. He contacted us late Sunday night, and I thought he would be on the flight to come down. So we talked to him again last time. He's really fine. He's going to live. He was just the flu. <laughs> First thing we'll talk about is we consider Nestle Karina. This is the Karina team within the Nestle organization. We've got several different operating companies that do different things. <laughs> we think they're the uh, by far the best in class. They've got a system, a process that they've implemented around the alerts, things are going on in business, driven around the four P's. You guys know the four P's. What those things are going on that are worthy to be told about? They want to know what those things are going to be. They've done that with the basic rules, a set of rules. And we've helped them implement them they've done over the last five years. They've done 21 different sets of rules. Uh, they kind of fill it back up in 18 of their lives because some of them got pretty noisy. So one of the problems with the rules is they give you a lot of information that's really noisy and you tend to either ignore it or not want to take action on it. So let's, let's pull that back. It's big data. We're all in retail. We've been working with big data for a long time. That's not new for us. We started back in the 80s. We're dealing with store level, item level, daily level data, every SKU, everything's going on the pipeline. We've had a big data problem for a long time. That's old news. Everything's done through being done, being done through batch processes. So this program is running overnight on the weekends to get the data ready, get it prepared, and deliver out to them in a batch oriented process. It really provides questions to the known answers. And so that means that we can't go build rules. They can't go build rules to look for things when they don't know what the question is going to be. They can only answer those questions I know to ask. They've done a great job. They've got 18 of them. They're world class in what they do. They don't know what they don't know. So they came to us, and here's an example of some of the output that ran. It's pretty boring stuff. It's because it's a data spreadsheet driven. Uh, we know what those things look like. They came and asked us for some changes. So we need to ask them the rules of this and help us implement that. And of course, we can go do that. It's real place stuff. It's pretty easy. Then they ask for some additional visualizations. So instead of static, you know, numbers based things, they wanted to see some pictures. They want charts and visuals and things like that of the data to make it more impactful. <coughs> really asked for something that was evolutionary. I want to get a little bit better. I want to get a little bit more of what I'm doing. I'm already best in class. I want to be just a little bit better. So that's what they asked us for was an evolution. We came back, we've been working on technology for, for quite a while. We went back in, in 2015, we met with all of our customers, asked them, you know, what do you really need? What would you need that would put us out of business? What's one of our jobs to put ourselves out of business? What we heard from our customers, and this is one of our best customers, first thing is make it easy. It's got to be easy. That made a lot of sense. The easiest thing about easy is give you something you already know how to do. You know, maybe learn something new. The second one was really the tougher one. Tell me what I don't already know. Tell me, answer the question for me that I don't even know to ask. And so we began this journey five years ago. How do we go do that when we don't even know what to go look for? So we came back with some artificial intelligence and things that we think are revolutionary and not evolutionary. First part of that is our learning package. This is the piece that we're using with them. It goes out and runs the data science. We're really replacing the rules with AI-driven data science. Most of you in the room have data science in your organization. Even if you don't call yourself a data scientist, I would guess that most of you who are in the room are data scientists. I know for one for sure Dan is. You guys have been doing data science for a long time. You kind of wild on the tools that you have to lift. That's, that's not new news. 
AI applied to that says, I need to go ahead and this technology and do that kind of work and do it for me across all the opportunities that might exist in the bank, not just focus on the questions that they already need to ask. Yeah, and it's for you. Now, I mentioned earlier that there was, they created 21 base rules. They got three of them turned off because they were noisy. The challenge with technology, finding out things that are valuable to know, is it finds out even more data than you already have before. Now, let it do that, and make that be something that's not overwhelming to you. Now, I've got so much to look at, I don't even know where to start. <coughs> so, we begin to use some AI and some machine learning in this case to do some algorithms that tell us what the score, what's the value of knowing this. Does it really matter or not? The next thing we have to do is, and so think about this scenario. Tell me what I don't already know. The key is, tell me. I don't know what the problem is going to be in the first place. So how do I know how to go visualize that and tell you that in a way that makes sense to you? And by the way, you're all different in the way you want to see things. Some of you want words. Some of you want pictures. Some of you just want the numbers. I would support all of you in answering questions that you need to know to ask through the different ways that you know I'm going to be able to visualize and see. Again, we use some AI stuff for that. These are things where AI is going to work today to make a big difference, a 10 x difference, not a 10 percent lift, but a 10 times lift in what's going on in the industry. And I read it in the last slide. Here we go. Got ahead of myself just a bit. First thing is we've got to get raw data and transform that into intelligent data. We all have access to huge amounts of raw data. We don't have a problem with our raw data. That's not a problem to be solved. We've got technology that can house it, store it, and do that in a quick and fast way. That's not the problem. I need that data to be smart. I need the insights in that to bubble up to me so I know what to go focus on. We really, for instance, in this scenario, we have raw data that items served by week. We make that data smarter by adding trends by adding predictive things to that data. So now we not only know that, we know what the trends are, we know what's going to be in the future. So we made the data smarter, not just the raw data, but made it smarter. We've also added some alerting. And I need alerting to be things that are not the norm. Most of the AI we deal with today, facial recognition, maps, things like that, are all about pattern making. I take a picture of Valerie's face, the AI goes through and says, based on that pattern, I think this is Valerie. And I'm pretty confident that it's Valerie. We have the same thing going on in this technology. We look at the patterns, the patterns in the sales, where you're selling, where you're not selling, what the price is, what the velocity is, all of those things start to tell the story. I now see this pattern in the data. I say, oh, this is an out of stock problem. This is an on shelf availability problem. This is a failure inventory problem. This is just a presentation problem in general. These are all patterns that are taking over to the record that we can tell you about. Drivers. The biggest thing when people say, tell me what I don't know, is I don't know why. I know what happened. Everybody in the room is really good at understanding and finding out what happened. That's yesterday's bar. Today's bar is I need to know why that happened. What are the things that are driving that to be different? What are the correlations? What are all the things in the math and the science that have to tell me about why something has occurred? I had a conversation the other night with one of my colleagues, and he said, my brand is down 12% in sales. I need to know why. Was it price? Was it product? Was it placement? Was it promotion? Four piece. Need to know why. Enriching the data. This is something that's valuable and important to do. Is in the, we have a data set. We know the data set. I need to make that data be even stronger. I need to add other data to it. I need to bring in public data. We we'll bring in weather and census. I need to bring all of that data to play and what's going on. And at the same time, I want to be able to enrich that data set. So part of this in storytelling, I need more data to go along with that. I need to know this actually was a holiday. This day was a holiday in this region. This was going on in the region from, from an event standpoint. There's the NFL games, there's Super Bowl weekend. All of those things matter. The technology being able to tell you why. More data is always better. Here's an example, I'm going to fast. Here's just an example of what this system has done for them. For next one. It's gone through. See on the left hand side, there's a bunch of different things that were created automatically. We don't necessarily know, we don't necessarily know how to predict what they find for us. We give us some categories, we give us some training in the data to say what's important to the customer. They care about price, they care about place and product and promotion, and there's four P's. There are a few other things, I need to go over and see what's going on by brand, at a glance, by category at a glance. What's in those things individually 
We absolutely don't know what to predict. So this dashboard that we saw, what it has for four different or five different quadrants, the technology is making decisions on what to show us there. One of the things that's scored high that are worth telling the story about. What are the things that are worth telling you about? Maybe you already knew these, maybe you didn't know these. This uh, example of another way that these insights are delivered. We talk about people and the way they consume, the way they communicate. Some people want pictures, some people want words, some people want the numbers. Here's an example of a visualization. You can fill all three of those things. So the first is basically just a, a title, a headline that says, what's going on? In South Town, 97.8%. It's important for me to know. It's a bit of a why. I want to know some of the whys, but some of the whys begin to get materialized, both visually. So this spark line tells me my daily in stocks are actually going down on this item. It's not, it's not going in the right direction. And that's a typical one that says, I believe in drilling the details. The first thing is I see some of the details highlighted in words. In the word consumer. I want to be able to hear the words, read the words, see the bullet points. The next thing I want to be able to do is get into some of the visualization around the data. So we go down one more level below that. Part of what got delivered in this was a visualization of that story. And visualization may need several different things to go along with it. So it's got other things over here I can add to it and take away. So give me the key points to let me go bring in other information to help me go communicate this. I've got to go sell this story to somebody so they'll go behave differently, they'll change what's going on, so it'll make a difference. I have to know why, and I have to know what to go do about it. Those two things all come in hand and go together. How do I go impact the workflows? So just knowing this is more is not enough. I have to know it, I have to be able to communicate, I have to be able to tell the story, and I have to be able to impact somebody to go make a decision to change their, their behavior. So the last piece is, I just want to see the numbers. My guess is a lot of you guys love just giving the numbers and I'll go do my own thing. We want to support that kind of use case as well. What difference is it making? First thing that happened was, and so we talked about the things they wanted to know, price, product, promotion. They've now got visibility to share, and their share of market, share of store, share of shelf, share of dollar, all of those things are now being analyzed by the tech. All of those things are looked at, the, the math is done on those. When they're important, when they're statistically different, to tell them something different, they now have visibility of those things without having to know to answer that question every day. They could have engineered rules-based systems that answered all those questions every day, and then it became noisy and they stopped paying attention to it. The key is to look at all of those things around share and tell me about them when they have something important to know, something important for me to share and communicate. That's why we're combining AI and business intelligence technology to be able to really effectively do things at scale and have complete coverage of all the things that are going on, not just coverage of the questions that I need to ask. Another example, price. Price is a complex thing. Price is going on. Price events are occurring at tens of thousands of locations across the country all the time. Everybody in the room has got this problem. We need to understand what are the exceptions, what are the trends, where are the outliers. One of the things we'll discover through this analytics was that the pricing exceptions that they had, what prices are off, were very regional in nature. There's some regional <laughs> factors to that. That helps them from a systemic standpoint go address those issues versus saying, I've got 500 of the 5,000 stores have a pricing issue. You need to know that 400 of those 500 were in the southeast and there's something going on from a competitive standpoint. I need to know the whys behind that. So I go do something about that, communicate that differently. Distribution details. A big part of this, again, because of the footprint, distribution by SKU, by store. I data, it's a lot of data. To figure out why I have issues, why I have an in-stock problem, why I have an on own shelf availability problem, why in this location am I selling less, my velocity is lower than in other places like it. The root causes of that are a great use case for this technology because it doesn't get tired. I want the tech to go off and work all night long and go do all this research and find all these things, figure out what the math from an unbiased standpoint, what the problem might be. And those things are important enough to bubble them up and tell me about those things. Another big key thing, and this is a problem we found many times over the years in delivering technology for people to build dashboards and reports is, you end up building those for one user. You go build that reports for somebody, somebody owns that report, they're the owner, they're the driver, 
you make it work very well for them. You leave the rest of your team off the table. They don't like that. They want to change to it. The worst thing that can happen is you get everybody involved and they create a group think and designing what everybody's going to get for the one thing that gets delivered. And now it becomes not unusable to everybody. Everybody has to compromise those things. <laughs> One of the keys to the visualization that we do and the artificial intelligence that we did with that is that, one, we understand each user. We can tailor it to each user. Matthew likes to see maps. Matthew wants to see a map as his first visual. James wants to see the numbers. He's a number guy. He's the numbers first. We can tailor it to their use patterns, how they think, how they want to work, to make that work for everybody, and not just for the one person to define your visuals. We're really defined around the questions we already need to have answered. Our goal, one of the ways that we measure success in any of these enterprises, any of these kind of projects, is how much of the time do you now have your team with their head up talking to the customer, <coughs> talking to other people on your team, convincing people to change their behaviors versus their head down, buried in a spreadsheet, trying to go find that insight that's there. When our teams have their heads down, their work is very biased. They don't have time to look at every possible opportunity. We want things to be unbiased as much as we can. So what's next? Nestle, and we're proud of this, is establishing themselves as a brand new basketball class, but it's a new class. The bar has been risen, has been raised there now. If you're not doing these things, you're being, being beat by your competition. Yesterday's bar was, I need world-class analytics to tell me what happened. Today's bar is, tell me why, and that why is across everything that I go through. That is the new bar. Be excited to see where the bar is next year. And I took the head, so there's the bar. Another big key to making analytics pay for itself have a good return on investment is get it integrated into the workflows. It's not a separate thing you should go do. I'm going to start the morning out by saying, I'm going to go look at my dashboard. Then I'm going to go do something about those. <coughs> go back to those later, back and forth, back and forth. You've got to continue to work on this technology being embedded into the workflows, whatever the workflows might be. I need this to work in the boardroom. <coughs> I need to behave differently when it's in the boardroom, but I need the boardroom have analytics as part of the decision making process. I need this in the back room of the warehouse. I need the decisions that they're making to be driven by analytics, be aided, be augmented by the analytics so they're doing the right thing and have the tools to help them do the right thing. Boardroom to back room. Everybody in that flow needs this embedded into their workflow. That's how we will make a difference. That's where you go to realize return on investment versus buying tools that sit on the shelf and generate reports and get emailed out. Get it into your workflows. Then you'll truly see a significant change in your return on your investment. This technology is constantly learning, constantly getting better. It's collecting more data. We talked a minute ago about keeping track of the fact that Matthew likes maps. Matthew may change his behavior soon. He may want something different later on. We're working on particular use cases. He may want something different. The technology is because they're collecting data along the way. We saw some really cool stuff this morning in the session with, with a lot of new technology. Most of it is just gathering more data. The robots scan the shelves, take the picture, just more data than we've ever had. That's very valuable. For us to leverage that and take advantage of it, we've got to go take the analytics and embed them into the workflows so we can go and actually use that data to make a difference. It's constantly learning. New workflows integrated. The easiest place to start with workflows integrated with analytics is in your team that does analytics. That's just a no-brainer. Work hard to get this integrated into workflows that are outside that group. So build in workflows for your leadership teams. So part of the workflow automatically includes analytics. Brings things to them they didn't know to ask. Any questions? Anybody have a question they don't know to ask? <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, what is typically, based on this representation, the list of inputs that you tend to have to make this work in the way that you described? 
So the most common input you have are going to be point of cell data. We've been collecting point of cell data for years. Uh, that's, the, that's the lowest bar. Short of that, it's hard to know exactly what's going on in the market, what's going on with the customers. But it's still a, a, a case where more data is better. We need to know not only what they bought, but when they bought it, what time of the day they bought it, how they paid for it. E-commerce is, is really giving us a lot of good, rich data. There's not a lot of consistency in the collection of e-commerce data. So that's still a bit of a challenge. And there was a session earlier this week with some folks who talked about some of the some of the headway that's being made in that respect. But uh, you at least need that information. Compare that up with everything that you can so you can understand some of the whys. So if all you know is point of sale data by week, sometimes it's kind of hard to understand the whys. We can enrich the data. We can bring in some other data that's just you know, publicly available and find out some of those whys. But bring in other things like what's going on internally, your shipments, and your orders, the ordering cycles, you know, the lead time that you have, all the inventory, what's the inventory by day. Does anybody think inventory in the stores is accurate? It is probably the least accurate data in our industry, for sure, maybe in the world. You can always equate it to the fact that when it's in the back room, it's in the warehouse, and it's coming out of the manufacturing plant, you have professionals that are managing that. Professionals are picking it up, professionals are counting it. Everything is managed by professionals. You put it on the shelf, and all of a sudden, you get a lot of amateurs like me walking down the aisle and messing it up. I pick up an item and put it in the wrong place, or I go to the self checkout and I scan the wrong item. Amateurs like me totally mess up inventory in stores. Another question. I mean, you talked a lot about uh, artificial intelligence. How would you say your artificial intelligence is in comparison to Power BI or Microsoft? What would make your AI better? Domain, domain knowledge and being so tools like Power BI, Tableau's got tools also. There's a lot of momentum in the world about AI, things like that being embedded in the analytical layers. They don't have the domain expertise and experience to know how to go weight things, what other data might be valuable that I can bring to the game. Those tools are only going to know the data that you knew to get. You had to go say, Power BI, here's the data, tell me what's going on. The science is kind of the same. There's not a lot of differentiation in the data science that's going on, work that's going on in that respect. It's, it's just math. Everybody's got math. I can't say our math is any better or any worse than anybody else's. But it's the domain knowledge, knowing the data that matters, bringing in additional data, enriching that data, doing some things that are specific to the retail domain, that's where, that's where we make a big difference. Can you give an example of a lie that you uncovered with testing data that makes some best in class? So some of the whys that they found out, or why we think they're best in class? So the whys they're finding is where they're finding correlation to specific things. So they had a rules-based engine, and the rules-based engine said, if I have a 2% change in this metric, let's say price is up or down by 2%, and some come tell me about that. What it didn't tell them about was the other data associated with that, the other things that were the whys behind that. Things like, is it regional in nature? Is it, is it competitive in nature? Are there other products that took a price drop, and that's why your prices are being impacted because of comps, things like that. So the biggest thing in that was the correlation to the other data that correlates to the thing that matters to them. I have pressure on price in the southeast. Why? What else is going on in the southeast to make that happen? I appreciate that you're working with us. It's not here. And I'm a simple gal. And I wonder if you could just give me one example, one clear example, of how one of the insights that you served up to them helped that or any other client, they gave a very discreet decision about how they were going to improve their business. They learned X, and because of that, they took this Y action, which improved their business. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Enjoyed your, your speech this morning, Austin. Oh, don't try to butter me up. <laughs> 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 we were people over 50, so I'm crazy about that. The biggest thing that they're finding is because they're now understanding the Ys, and the whys are kind of grouped up into some areas. They're not all individual whys. They're able now to do some systemic things that address some of the issues. So we talked about some of the distribution challenges that they've had. They've been able to find that there's some root causes to some of those that are systemic in nature. They're actually making some changes to how they warehouse and the pack sizes of a few items, not all of them, but a few items that are going to drastically improve their shelf performance. So they're able to find through the fact that the, the technology said you got a presentation issue, got related and got categorized up in the root causes for those, 
where actually distribution flows to those stores. My pack sizes didn't allow me to optimize for my best inventory. So one of the things that we do is we come out with what we consider an ideal inventory. Ideal inventory has really two different metrics to it. They use this for that set of analytics. Ideal is ideal from a selling standpoint. What's the ideal inventory level in this store that will ensure I sell the most? That competes with what's the ideal inventory for me to have return on investment. Those two things are rarely the same number. That's when you need the people on your team to come in and make some decisions about which one of those two I want to drive to. A lot of that has to do with the customer also. What's your customer want to do? Are they driving top line sales or are they driving return on investment from the inventory perspective? Unfortunately, they change their mind. If, if, if every quarter everybody wants to drive inventory down so they look good to Wall Street. Every other, every other month of the year, we want to go drive inventory up because I want my out of stocks to be as low as I can. I want to increase my sales. So that's one example where they were able to use that to systemically identify some packaging changes. Thank you. Okay. How about shopper insights? Uh, sorry, how about shopper insights? One of the examples I had in my real life is we were having a brand that is growing very fast. And we were trying to dig in where is the common like, source of volume. Yep. Um, through panel, we were able to understand that Asian population was improving closure on like Henry's in California, for example. Can you overlay panel data to understand more about the shopper insights and the why rather than more the, the more of the key Yeah, and that's a great example of where more data is better. So the more you can get to those technologies that we need, the better it is. That's a challenge though, because that data is sometimes difficult to harmonize with your other data that you have. I don't have UPC level panel data. I've got panel data that's so much different kinds of aggregates and information. Using some of the backend technology, you need some of that harmonization of that to be able to bring that data to play with the analytics. We give the analytics basically all the engine, all the data. The data science says, here's all the data. Go figure out, is there a correlation or not? So finding in fact there was a correlation to that data for that consumer in California is it was something that was really pretty valuable to know. If you had somebody that knew to go ask that question, you were able to go find it because you knew to go ask it. You thought that might be an opportunity. Okay. So is your customer or who you're presenting to only the client in Nestle, or do you put things together that they can then take to retail? And what are the questions that we need to make sure we're answering to a retailer as opposed to just the supplier? Yep, that's a great question. It's a great opportunity. And this, there's a lot of headway being made in that arena right now. Where I need analytics, I need my analytics to be shared across the workflow. Workflow is not just within Nestle, not just within their team. I've got to share that with my customers. I've got to share that with my manufacturing partners, all of that. That's where we need to be able to tell the same story in a lot of different ways. And so the cloud-based technologies are really making those kind of things possible, and that's really changing at a very rapid pace. But that analytics is being shared with their customers right now. terms of the math that you use, you get a lot of different ways to measure the same kind of thing. Uh, and those are really not new metrics, but they're new ways to measure the metrics. So yes and no. <laughs> is that short of that? <laughs> short. Oh, it's not short, but short one. Okay. Another short one? Anybody else? Yeah. Real basically, what type of resources does the, does the customer need to engage with it? They need uh, people willing to change. Like how many, like for instance, if I was going to use your services, how many people would I need in my organization? I don't think you need more than what you already have in the analytics now. You're going to go bring new tools to that team, make them more powerful, get a bigger return on investment in them. I don't think you necessarily need to add people to go do that kind of thing. You're going to need IT involvement in some cases because you're going to want to get some data from them and make that happen. You're going to want to make sure that everything you do is secure and safe and all those things. But uh, we rarely see a need for a headcount increase to do this. The key to what you're going to do is you're going to make your team much more valuable in what they're doing. Their head's going to be up talking to people, selling ideas, getting changes to happen, versus their head down and buried trying to find the things that they think they know to go ask. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.